Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we're very pleased to have uh, Rod Ewing here to uh, talk to us about the promise and peril of nuclear. Uh, Rod is a professor in nuclear security and a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and the Freecourt Institute for Energy, and I'm sure many other things as well. <laughs> um, so we're very happy to have Rod here. Please take it away. All right. Well, good morning uh, and welcome to Stanford um, under very difficult circumstances. Um, we're a small enough group that actually, as I'm giving a lecture, uh, just shout out uh, and uh, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, but then I may push along uh, with my eye uh, to the clock. So put, you can put questions uh, also on chat, or uh, I've inserted uh, time within the lecture where I'll pause and gather up your questions, um, oral or on chat, and discuss them. So um, let's do it this way. If it's a point of clarification, then shout out so I can address it immediately. If it's a larger question, uh, wait for the question um, section and there'll be two, one in the middle and one, one at the end. And I'd like to start by looking at the uh, uh, results from the poll. Uh, I had two questions, and this is mainly for my information. Uh, the first is, will nuclear power be an important source of energy for the United States in the future? Um, uh, so, and the second is, does nuclear power play a significant role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions? So if you could just uh, answer those questions. Good. So a uh, majority of you think that uh, nuclear will play an important role uh, of, uh, as a source of energy for the United States in the future. And you 100% think it plays a significant role uh, could, could play um, a significant role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. All right, good. That gives me uh, some idea of uh, your positions. And I'll, as I shape um, uh, what I say, I'll try to challenge some of your fundamental uh, assumptions. Okay, let's get started. Well, what I'll talk about, of course, is uh, heavily shaped by my own background and my research interest. And my research interest has to do with uh, nuclear materials, everything from spent fuel to the high level waste associated with uh, reprocessing of spent fuel uh, to uh, nuclear materials, fissile materials that now uh, require disposal. Uh, so mainly, uh, my work deals with the back end of the fuel cycle. Now, there are a lot of different perspectives that one can take on nuclear energy, uh, looking both at its promise or its peril. Uh, protect, protect one of the, uh, let's say, most common um, uh, values seen in um, uh, nuclear power is if you look at the diagram on the upper left, uh, that shows the increasing CO2 concentration in the Earth's atmosphere. This is an old diagram. Uh, we've now passed 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide. So climate change is a major concern. And uh, a question is what would be the role of nuclear energy in reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, but there are concerns with um, uh, nuclear power or nuclear things, let's say. Uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons. This is uh, an atmospheric test in Nevada. Uh, in the upper right, uh, you can see the diagram, which is uh, an inventory of the global, uh, global inventory of plutonium. Uh, in, and so you can see that we, the world has two problems. One is increasing CO2 concentrations uh, in the atmosphere, uh, but we also suffer from increasing plutonium inventories as uh, plutonium, a man-made element, uh, grows into the fuel of nuclear reactors. And then there's the uh, issue of catastrophic failure of nuclear power plants. This is a picture of uh, Chernobyl, 
uh, but uh, it could just as easily have been a picture of, of Fukushima. Okay, so nuclear energy, or I would say better, uh, nuclear processes uh, have really important uh, positive elements. Primary among them, I would say, is the, the uh, production of energy. Uh, but nuclear processes provide for medical treatments. Uh, uh, some would argue it's a deterrent against global war, uh, health uh, applications, and so on. And at the nuclear peril side, this is a slide from a colleague, Sig Hecker, uh, it's uh, nuclear war, proliferation of nuclear weapons, nuclear, nuclear terrorism, uh, radiological terrorism, um, uh, health and um, environmental disasters associated with, let's say, the catastrophic failure of um, nuclear power plants. So I always like to go back and look at a little bit of the history and, and emphasize a few points. And considering the history of all things nuclear during the 20th century, probably the most important day was December the 2nd, 1942, when Enrico Fermi and his colleagues demonstrated that it was possible to have sustained nuclear reactor reactions. And I'll discuss what that means in a moment. Um, this uh, event was the culmination of the exciting physics during the first half of the 20th century. And I just want to touch on a few of the names that played a critical role in getting um, us to the point of uh, this first reactor. This is the Chicago Pile 1 reactor uh, built by Fermi and colleagues um, under the stands at the uh, Stag Field. Um, and so let's look at some of the, the major uh, players. Probably the most important person in this story is Marie Curie and her uh, husband, Pierre Curie. Um, I'm a mineralogist uh, as well, and so uh, this is Gladowskite. Marie Curie's uh, maiden name was Gladowska, and uh, this is Curite uh, for uh, Pierre Curie, uh, both uranium minerals. And uh, for, as I mentioned, people, I'll try to give you a, a reference that you can uh, go to to get, uh, of course, much more of their in interesting story. But Marie Curie, as a graduate student, um, didn't discover radioactivity, but she invented the word radioactivity. Uh, she's the only person to have received two Nobel Prizes in two different sciences, in this case, physics and chemistry. Her first prize in physics was shared with her husband, Pierre, and Becquerel, the discoverer of uh, radioactivity. Originally, she wasn't on the list to receive uh, with the other two, uh, the Nobel Prize, but her husband, Pierre, um, uh, with great justification, refused to accept the, the uh, Nobel Prize without uh, including his wife, uh, Marie. So the discovery of radioactivity opened up a whole new type of physics. I'm going to skip over uh, a very interest, the very interesting story, uh, but it became even more interesting with the work of Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann um, during uh, or just before the um, uh, uh, Second World War, where uh, Hahn and Strassmann uh, this is their experimental apparatus, so you can see it's very crude, uh, discovered that when they irradiated uh, heavy atoms with, such as uh, uranium, uh, with neutrons, um, they uh, created some new elements, in this case, uh, barium-141. Uh, and so Strassmann was the, the chemist who uh, was responsible for doing, I would say, the most important part of this work, that is identifying the elements that went with the irradiation. Now, this experiment was based on the idea that if one irradiated uh, heavy elements with uh, neutrons, 
uh, one would get even heavier elements. And so they were very confused by the fact that they were getting lighter elements. And that confusion, uh, uh, so they reported their results, uh, but more importantly, by letter, uh, they uh, sent the results to Lise Meitner. Um, and Lise Meitner had been a member of the Institute in Berlin, uh, being um, a woman and uh, uh, Jewish. She had never been allowed inside the big building. The big building is there. Uh, she did all of her work uh, in a small, almost hut, behind the, the building. Um, and then in the 1930s, I've forgotten the exact year, she fled to uh, Sweden uh, with the help of her colleagues uh, to escape uh, the uh, uh, Nazis. Uh, she was in Sweden when she received news of this strange phenomena. Uh, her nephew, Otto Frisch, was a physicist. And so on a ski trip, uh, and in discussions, what they realized is that if they took the uh, uh, drop model of the nucleus developed by Niels Bohr in Copenhagen, uh, they could describe a process or imagine a process that would lead to the splitting of the atom. And uh, uh, this was the origin of the word fission. Otto thought of this and uh, the beginning of the story of uh, uh, nuclear fission, nuclear energy, and nuclear, nuclear weapons. Otto Frisch, uh, during the war, found his way uh, to Los Alamos. He was part of the Manhattan Project. He did some very uh, exciting and interesting experiments. Uh, one called trick, uh, uh, Tickling uh, the Tail of a, of a Sleeping Dragon, where he would uh, do experiments to determine the critical mass, I'll discuss that more later, of, um, of uranium and uh, plutonium. Once it was realized that it was possible to split the atom, a Hungarian physicist, uh, Leo Slizard, um, uh, realized that it might be possible to have a chain reaction, a sustained chain reaction, because in addition to splitting the atom, there were some extra neutrons. And so he envisioned uh, this series of steps that would occur very rapidly, release huge amounts of energy. Uh, Slizard had fled to the United States, uh, and it was Slizard who uh, really coached Einstein uh, in writing uh, the letter um, uh, to uh, President Roosevelt, pointing out that this was potentially uh, an important source of energy that could be released by a bomb. And so that letter really initiated the Manhattan Project, and we'll say a little more about that later. Enrico Fermi, an Italian physicist, um, his Nobel Prize was in 1938, his wife was Jewish, and uh, they went to Stockholm to pick up his uh, 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 Nobel Prize. Uh, but that was uh, uh, a little bit of a ruse in that he was actually on his way to the United States uh, fleeing uh, fascist Italy. And so he joined the Manhattan Project and led the team uh, first at uh, uh, Columbia uh, designing very crude concepts for a reactor, uh, but then finally demonstrating uh, what Slizard had um, uh, proposed, that it was possible to have uh, sustained nuclear reactions. So that brings us to 1942. So this is about uh, 78 years ago. And one thing that's important to realize about nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, in many ways, this is an old technology. Your generation is excited by an entirely different array of technologies. Um, nuclear somehow is old hat and um, concerns for weapons proliferation, um, development of new nuclear reactors, 
in some ways, I would say this has fallen by the wayside. Well, this reactor already in this picture, you can see some of the important components. Uh, the graphite blocks, uh, there are 45,000 uh, bricks of graphite. Uh, we'll have to discuss what that's for in a moment. Uh, uh, five uh, tons of uranium metal, uh, 45 tons of uranium oxide. And this fellow here is in charge of uh, uh, a jerry-rigged device that would, um, with, um, uh, by cutting a rope, uh, a rod would drop into the reactor, uh, a rod made of cadmium that would absorb neutrons if the reactor got out of control. You'll see there's no shielding, there's no uh, water surrounding the reactor as shielding and also to cool it. It operated at about half a watt. So, but this reactor once uh, in 1942, it had been demonstrated it was possible to have a sustained uh, nuclear reaction, led to the construction of the B reactor at Hanford, Washington. Uh, it's now a, a national monument. And the B reactor, you can see this wall, was a huge uh, pluto plutonium production facility. And you'll, I'll talk about the fission process in a moment. Um, it was built in just a year. And um, you would take your uranium, put it in uh, aluminum tubes with a diameter the size of a quarter, and you can see the holes in the front of this reactor. You would push those tubes through um, the reactor, operating reactor. Uh, the uranium would be converted to some plutonium. You'd leave the, uh, uh, these capsules inside the reactor and then finally push them out the other side where there was a big collection pool. Uh, and then those uh, capsules would be chemically processed to reclaim the plutonium. And this plutonium uh, would be used later uh, to bomb uh, Nagasaki. Now, that's on the weapons side. Uh, on the power side, the first reactor was uh, in the US was a ship shipping port atomic power station. Um, in um, on the Ohio River in Pennsylvania. Uh, it went online in 1957. So just note that that took some time. And in fact, this is the core of the reactor. And that core was uh, originally destined to be a power uh, source for an aircraft carrier, a uh, nuclear aircraft carrier um, that was canceled. And so there is this close connection between uh, nuclear energy and nuclear power, uh, particularly in the, the earliest days. Where are we today on the nuclear power side? Uh, I didn't update these figures. This is um, um, 2017. Uh, there are over 400 uh, nuclear power reactors generating nearly um, uh, 400 gigawatts of electricity around the world the world. Uh, in the US, um, we have a decreasing number of reactors. We're down to, I think, 99 uh, reactors today. Um, and those 99 reactors uh, account for about 20% of the electricity that's used in the United States. That's decreasing slightly. It may be down to 19 or 18%. Globally, we uh, ask our, our, the question, well, what's happening uh, to this idea of uh, nuclear power? Uh, this purple is North America, US and Canada. Uh, Canada also has nuclear power. You can see that it's pretty constant in, uh, sorry for the uh, uh, clock in the background. You can see that the number or the amount of electricity generated by nuclear power is pretty constant. Uh, but the growth, most recent growth in the use of nuclear power is in Asia, mainly China. Uh, in China, 
Uh, there are nine uh, reactors under construction, about 40 uh, that uh, are in the planning stages. Not all of those will, will finally be built. Uh, but some projections suggest that by the year 2030, just 10 years from now, uh, China uh, will surpass the U.S. and uh, be generating more electricity uh, uh, from nuclear fission uh, than the United States does uh, uh, now. The, um, even with that rapid expansion, and that's very rapid expansion, the same projections uh, say that, that then only four to five percent of the electricity consumed uh, in China would come from nuclear power plants. Okay, now uh, it's easy to just focus on the nuclear power plant and the generation of electricity. But it's important to realize with any energy source, there's a before and after. The before is the exploration for and extraction of the material used to generate the energy. And the after is the waste. So for fossil fuels, of course, petroleum exploration, um, coal mining, uh, these are at the front end of the fossil fuel cycle. And at the back end of the fossil fuel cycle, we would find uh, the greenhouse gas gases that are, that are emitted uh, during the combustion of, um, of uh, these fossil fuels. Depending on the physics and chemistry of the process, these cycles are different. And the nuclear fuel cycle is um, unique in that uh, there's this recycle uh, arrow, uh, which we'll discuss in a moment. Uh, that is, there's the possibility in a nuclear power plant to generate uh, fissile material that then can be used to create more energy. So this is, uh, you may have heard the expression breeder reactors. Uh, we don't have time to go through all of these steps, uh, but each of these steps has implications not only for nuclear power, uh, but can be related back to uh, nuclear weapons proliferation. Now, let me dwell a little bit on the physics of fission. Uh, this is very elementary, so it's not even the physics of fission, just some um, perspectives on fission. So the whole idea is to split an atom. Uh, this is what uh, uh, Hahn and Strassman demonstrated. Uh, and with the splitting of that atom, uh, you get uh, the fission fragments. For Hahn, that was the barium-141. Some extra neutrons. For uh, Lazard, those were what would drive succeeding splitting of the atoms, the chain reaction and the energy, which can either be released essentially instantaneously in a weapon, or if controlled, that energy, 200 MeV, uh, for every splitting event, uh, could drive a nuclear power reactor. Now, as it happens, there are different isotopes of uranium. Uranium-235 is the one that's fissile, meaning it's most easily split by neutrons. These neutrons, though, have to um, uh, be slow, call them thermal neutrons. And by slow, I mean that the energy that uh, this impending neutron has is a fraction of an electron volt. Uh, these neutrons are traveling at about two kilometers per second. The neutrons that result from the fission event, these are fast neutrons. They're traveling at about 20,000 kilometers per second. Uh, they're energies of, let's say, 2 to 3 MeV. The energy, uh, again, as I've said, is 200 MeV. First, the fission fragments. 
you split the uranium atom, so you end up with the bimodal distribution of new elements shown here. This is the Z number, the mass number, I'm sorry, mass number across the bottom, not Z. So that's understandable. And in fact, most of these fission product elements um, are the nuclear waste that finally we'll have to deal with because they're highly radioactive. Many have short half-lives, but a few, by a few, I mean four or five, they have half-lives stretching to hundreds of thousands to millions of years. These neutrons, the extra neutrons, the fast neutrons, have to be slowed down in order to be slow enough to interact with the uranium-235 nucleus. We slow them down by surrounding uh, the fissionable material with light elements uh, so that when the neutrons bounce off these light elements, they slow down. And so that's the role of carbon. We saw that with the Chicago pile number one. Or you could use water, but you need to slow down these extra neutrons to propagate the chain reaction by splitting the uranium-235 nucleus. Uranium-235 is only 1% of the uranium we dig out of the ground. And so in order to sustain a nuclear reaction, we typically, not always, it depends on the, the uh, design of the reactor, enrich the uranium-235 from less than 1% to maybe 4 to 5%. Also, geometry matters. That is, we want uh, the, uh, react, the nuclear reaction to occur uh, in a shape that saves neutrons. And you save neutrons by having a lower surface area uh, so that you lose fewer uh, neutrons uh, to the surroundings. Now, the fast neutrons or, and slow neutrons when they interact with the more abundant isotope, uranium-238, it makes up about 99% of what natural uranium ore consists of. It doesn't split, but it absorbs that neutron, creating uranium-239. There are a series of uh, decay events, and you create uh, plutonium-239. Plutonium-239 is fissile, and so it grows into the fuel from the more abundant neutron capture reactions on uranium-238. And since it's fissile, it also, in a nuclear fuel, fissions and generates energy. In fact, in a normal reactor, commercial reactor, about a third of the energy generated comes from fissioning plutonium-239. Plutonium is very important. It's fissile. You can make a weapon with it. So that means if you take the used fuel and chemically separate the plutonium from the uranium, uh, then uh, you have material for a weapon. Now, I know this is a little fast, but I'll repeat uh, some of these uh, points as we come to uh, their importance. Why um, uh, uh, is this important, or what is the source of the energy? And it has to do with this curve, the, the binding energy curve. There's a nice uh, uh, short book by John McPhee, famous uh, writer on the binding energy curve and, and uh, uh, weapon. Uh, scientist. But what this shows very quickly is that there, the, bond, the uh, binding energy per nucleon, per proton or neutron in the nucleus, is highest for uh, iron and nickel elements in that part of the periodic chart. It's lower for very heavy elements, and it's much lower for very light elements, like hydrogen and helium. This means that you can increase the binding energy when you, as an example, split the nucleus. You move it toward a more strongly bound uh, nucleus. And that releases energy. 
or one could take light elements and fuse them and that releases, releases energy and that additional energy from fission and fusion comes from a slight loss of mass using Einstein's famous equation which generates huge amounts of energy because after all this is the speed of light squared a very large number okay so with fusion we we can have hydrogen bombs with fission we can have um, uh, bombs such as were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Okay, so with the fuel cycle, there are two possibilities. An open fuel cycle uh, in which we mine, mill, and here's the enrichment step for the uranium-235. We fabricate a fuel, it goes into the reactor, we irradiate it, we pull it out, we let it cool down because it's thermally hot and then we dispose of it. For an open fuel cycle, in terms of nuclear prolif proliferation, the enriched uranium, once enriched to uh, much higher levels of uh, uranium-235, um, can be used for a weapon. The closed fuel cycle, such as practiced by the French, goes through the same steps. You have enrichment of the uranium. You have chemical processing. They reclaim, sorry, I'm pointing to my screen. They reclaim the uranium and plutonium, run the plutonium back through the reactor. This can be done several times and get additional energy. In this case, the enriched uranium can be used to make weapons or if the plutonium is diverted from the chemical processing plant, such as uh, has, had, has happened in North Korea, that plutonium can be used for a weapon. In the US, we've had two fuel cycles. For nuclear power, um, uh, we fabricate fuel, run it through a reactor, and that fuel is not reprocessed. It goes hopefully to a geologic repository. On the defense side, we've had reprocessing, reprocessing of reactor fuel, that reactor, the B reactor at Hanford, or reprocessing of submarine fuel. And that creates waste from um, uh, uh, that, the process. High-level waste, those are the fission product elements, that bimodal distribution, and then material, true waste, transuranic waste, material contaminated mainly by plutonium. This is just a picture of the spent fuel as it comes out of reactor. You can see it's fractured. It's about a, a centimeter across. It's fractured because the thermal gradient from the center to the edge of this one centimeter um, in diameter um, pellet is uh, about 1300 degrees C. And you, when you look in more detail, you see these bubbles. The bubbles come from uh, the fact that some of the fission product elements in that bimodal distribution are gases, and so they accumulate in, in the structure. In fact, about 3% of spent fuel consists of these fission product elements after an average burn up. And it's important to realize in terms of disposal, uh, those in red are quickly released and those in blue are less quickly released. And so the disposal problem with spent fuel is not only the uranium, which is not so, such a serious and challenging problem, but this gives you a, an idea of the array of um, fission product elements and their location in the fuel. The US now has about 80,000 metric tons of fuel. And depending on whether reactors are renewed or not, uh, we can expect to have about 130,000 metric tons of fuel. From, on the defense side, we have a considerable amount of high-level waste. 
That's from the reprocessing of um, uh, fuel from plutonium production reactors. And this also requires uh, disposal. This is just a chart of um, kind of the list of waste in the US in 2010. I'll simply point out that spent fuel from commercial power reactors, and, and we have now, as I said, 80,000 metric tons, uh, in terms of curie content, about 40 billion curies is the main actor in terms of what we have to do. So commercial nuclear power plants are generating in terms of activity, radioactivity, a tremendous amount of, of um, waste, although the volume is contained and very small. Uh, I won't dwell on Yucca Mountain, but uh, if you um, follow this subject at all, you realize that the sole repository for high level waste in the US proposed repository was Yucca Mountain. Uh, that's met with much resistance in Nevada. And so the, the history of nuclear waste management and disposal in the US is an expensive and sad uh, uh, story. So I've touched on nuclear fuel cycles. They affect the carbon cycle in different ways. The geochemical cycles here refer to nuclear waste. Okay, let me just say a little bit about uh, the weapon side. I'll just use two or three minutes so you can ask a few questions if you want. So those plutonium production reactors um, th led to the gadget, which was uh, tested at the Trinity site in New Mexico. Uh, this is a spherical um, uh, bomb. Uh, there were two types, and it was tested in, uh, in July 16th, 1945, so uh, 75 years ago. Uh, it uh, was a sobering um, uh, demonstration of the power of nuclear weapons. And the power comes, and we've already discussed the physics a little bit, uh, from two approaches. You can have a gun type assembly where you take uranium-235, two pieces, and using conventional explosives, you drive them to one another, reach a critical mass, and you have an explosion. Or you can take the plutonium-239, and I showed you where the uranium-235 and the plutonium-239 come from, and using high explosive focus, collapse the volume of the uh, plutonium-239 pit and uh, 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 get an explosion. A gun type assembly was uh, the type of weapon dropped on Hiroshima. The implosion assembly using plutonium was dropped on Nagasaki. The devastation was um, complete. Uh, the number of lives lost was between the two cities, let's say several hundred thousand. Uh, this initiated an arms race, which you can see uh, part of it listed here with uh, uh, the different countries who have developed nuclear weapons. And of course, uh, there are others such as Israel, uh, North Korea, uh, and Iran is, was and is on, on the way. The big change in the 1950s was the fusion, hydro, the hydrogen bomb, taking advantage of fusion of light, light elements. And the, the challenge is that we have a lot of fissile material uh, around the world. Um, and Commercial power plants, which we often think of as not part of this story, as part of the fuel cycle for nuclear power plants, we've separated plutonium and we, it amounts to an equivalent of 53,000 weapons. Uh, I'll just say the doomsday clock has never been, uh, this is uh, 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 Bulletin of Atomic Scientists uh, 
was created at the end of uh, uh, the Manhattan Project in the 1940s. The doomsday clock tells us how far scientists thinks we think we are from nuclear holocaust. Um, and when the hydrogen bomb was um, uh, developed, um, it was at its lowest point, which was two minutes to midnight. But now we're 100 seconds to midnight. I can't tell you why, but this is the lowest it's ever been, the most dangerous time. And I commend to you a very recent book out in the last few months by Bill Perry and Tom Kalina uh, that will tell you why. So sorry to take so much of the question time, but now I'm open to questions. So yeah, just cut, cut me off when- Okay, I will. Um, we do have one question in the chat, which I think you answered at least in the aggregate, but I'll, I'll get us started with it, which is how much radioactive waste does a nuclear plant generate? I imagine the, the average plant. Okay, so um, uh, annually, each nuclear power plant on average generates 20 metric tons of used fuel. And that's where most of the radioactivity will be. Uh, there's also intermediate and low level waste associated with just running the plant. But in terms of radioactivity, it's the spent or used fuel uh, that is the source of uh, most of the waste. Great. Uh, Katie, go ahead and, or Kate, sorry, go ahead and ask your question. Hi. Um, that was really helpful, first of all, so thank you. Um, I have been really interested in development work and I've heard a lot about like modular nuclear power units, especially being developed by like Bill Gates, the companies associated with him. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on like the potential for that powering developing regions and if you think there's like any risks. Okay, so uh, the answer is necessarily complicated. I'll give you the, the very short answer. So the attraction for small modular reactors is uh, reduced cost because they're modular and because they're smaller, then they can be placed around the country and, and uh, for specific applications. So the, and the, the um, uh, regulatory process would be simpler if we all built the same kind of reactors and the, Nuclear Regulatory Commission was familiar with them and just could approve them. So those are positive. But what you have to realize is that after all, they're fission reactors. So it doesn't matter whether you have your fission event in a large gigawatt facility or in a smaller modular reactor, as long as you're making a lot of electricity or heat from large or small reactors, you still have the fission product or the waste problem to deal with. And the waste problem is not only disposal, but keep in mind, it could involve uh, processing the fuel, certainly involves transportation of the fuel. So to this extent that let's say small modular reactors are successful economically, um, I would say I'd like to, to understand why they would be considered successful from an environmental impact point of view. And that really hasn't been uh, addressed. Yeah, I, just, I had a quick question. Um, given the urgency that a lot of people talk about cre uh, greenhouse gases and everything, um, the environmental impact, obviously, of the well, you know storage, processing, transportation of spent fuels is a big thing. But um, basically, what's your opinion on the future of nuclear? There's a lot of pros and a lot of cons. Oh, that's a great question. It's a good way to maybe end our session. So I've been to many conferences where nuclear power is the answer. Okay. It does, you know, it's uh, CO2 or greenhouse gases aren't emitted except in the very smallest uh, uh, scale. 
But most of, and then the discussion is on advanced reactor systems. And those advanced reactor systems are projected by the nuclear community, I'm a member of that community, to come online in 10, 20, 50 years. And my concern is that's not soon enough. If nuclear is the answer, then it has to arrive on the scene and at a scale uh, that can have an impact on the carbon cycle. And that's tough. Just to give you an idea, if we wanted to uh, hold CO2 emissions constant, and we use, you may be familiar with the uh, uh, concept of, of um, wedges by Soklo and Pagala, um, and if not, I'll just say it, if we doubled the number of reactors worldwide, which means more than doubling because many need to be replaced, uh, that could only contribute about one eighth of what we need in order to bring um, uh, CO2 emissions to a constant level, not a decreasing level. So doubling or tripling or quadrupling, this is a huge job in the best of times. And it's an even larger job if you're on a tight schedule. So the key is timing and scale. 